All right. Welcome to the Denver Erlang and Elixir Meetup. If you're joining on YouTube, this is for Monday, May 1st, 2023. Promotional consideration for the meetup tonight is provided by Praxial.io. Praxial.io is an application security platform for Elixir and Phoenix apps. So big thank you to Honorio Kanachi for coming out tonight and talking to us about using Elixir for shell scripting. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and we're going to go over to his talk. For what led me to shell scripting. Ah, thank you. All right. So I'm going to shut off my screen momentarily, and I will, I'll will i tell you when to, to switch to the next slide. Anyway, part of what led me to shell scripting was, if you, you know, when I was started playing with functional languages, like nobody would even consider, oh, you got to write C Sharp, you got to write Java, you got to do object oriented. And so I, I wanted to keep my stuff in practice. And so I, I started writing shell scripts just for myself. Like, hey, I, I just need a script to uh, to copy this file from one place to another, and I can just do it in a shell script, and that keeps my my the syntax fresh in my head. So, um, okay, so tonight we're going to talk about using shell scripts for Elixir for fun and profit. And you can go to the next slide, Michael. Thank you. So, what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm assuming that pretty much everybody here, well, let me go by my script here. <laughs> We're going to be talking about shell scripting with Elixir. Here's a list of what we'll be discussing. Uh, I want to do a little preliminary discussion because I want to make sure we all have the same understanding of some essential concepts. Then we'll talk a little bit about why it's your, worth your while to write shell scripts. Uh, because the next question I usually hear is along the lines of, okay, I can understand why I would want to write shell scripts but why not write them in the native batch language? And that's a good question. I'll address that. Then we'll look at an Elixir shell script and we'll show how we can actually run the shell script. Um, well, actually it's good you have a slide deck, Michael, because I think you'll be able to bring this up yourself because I, I actually did it on like an online thing. So cool. Um, and because the common question, we'll also discuss the difference between the .ex extension and the .exs extension, why that, that factors in the shell scripts. Um, another common issue, we, we, we want to avoid repeating ourselves, of course. It's always a bad idea as a developer to repeat yourself. So we'll discuss how we can reuse common parts of shell scripts. And then we'll discuss some reasons why you might not want a sh shell script with Elixir. And I also want to say, if you have a question or a comment, you know, raise your hand, please. I only ask you to do that because I don't want us talking over each other. Because if we talk over each other, it gets real hard to understand what anybody's saying. Um, but I, I'd rather people ask me questions right when they occur to them rather than waiting for the end. We'll have some time at the end also to ask questions and do Q&A. But if you have a question and it comes up, just raise your hand, please. So I, I'll know that there's a question and we can discuss it. Okay, next slide, please. So what is a shell? Actually, it's probably more appropriate to call it a layer but term shell is what we've gotten from the developers who came before us. If you think of it as a layer which allows us to interact with the OS and the hardware in a relatively easy way, that's, that's the right idea for a shell. Um, you know, because most software development really is about finding an abstraction that makes things easier for us. We want black boxes. We, can, we don't want to actually deal with the underlying hardware and stuff. If I had to write a low-level routine myself to fetch a file from a hard drive, and then I had to go through, oh, all right. <laughs> okay. And I had to go through and like, okay, here's the first segment. And then the next segment is there and do all that. I'd never get anything done. Luckily, the OS abstracts that for me and says, here, here's a file and puts it in a buffer for me. And so that's part of what shell does. Um, you might also hear shells called terminals. This goes back to the days when, you know, uh, a lot of work was done on, you know, mainframes on terminals where they'd have a dumb terminal with a green screen and stuff like this. Um, so if that's a shell, what's a shell script? Well, a shell script is a way of giving directions to the various executables that you know are in your OS, telling them, okay, I want you to do this and then do this and do that and do the other thing, okay? Um, just like a, a script for actors, it tells them what to do, where to go, all this kind of thing. You might sometimes hear shell scripts called batch files. Uh, if you hear that term, it's because again, it goes back to old 
computer usage, back in the day when they had mainframes, a lot of things were done in what were called batch processes. Uh, very rarely did they do things what they called real time. Batch process versus real time is like, batch process would be like reconciling your checkbook at the end of the month. Real time would be like writing down a, a particular transaction in your checkbook. That's the difference. Batch process is like do a bunch of stuff at once, get it all done, processed. And real time is like do things in, in a, a very interactive way. So batch files, as you might guess, kind of are set up to not have user interaction. They're kind of set up to be run automated and not have to wait for a user to give them some kind of input or something. Um, most times, most, most of us are used to doing things kind of in a uh, transactional fashion, right? But there are certain things that are still doing batch processes. Like you know, I, I don't think Starbucks instantly loads up every transaction from local Starbucks to their central computers, although they may, I don't know. But I would suspect that probably be like a batch transaction sort of thing. The other thing to, to note here before we get away from it is we use the term script. Script is an interesting term because not just because it's telling the OS what to do, but it's also, it's not compiled in the sense of building like an executable, native executable image. Um, you When compilation is, it, it can be a real slippery term because sometimes when you say compilation, you mean reducing instructions down to, to actual native machine code. Other times we say compilation, like in the case of Elixir, what you mean is translating it into code for the virtual machine, the beam. Um, scripts are customarily, normally they're not compiled. They're they're parsed and they're, you know, and then they're run by the, uh, the virtual machine or whatever it is pretty interactively. There's not like a, a whole image there. Elixir scripts, as far as I know of, are actually compiled. Uh, I will get into the, to what I mean by that when we get into the difference between EX and EXS. Um, oh, and one more point before I forget it. On Linux, Unix, Mac OS X, you can do different shells. Um, it's also possible on Windows, but it's not really common for people to use a different shell on Windows. It is possible to use like a different terminal on Windows, but most people don't bother. Um, like on Linux, you can have the Bash shell, which is short for born again shell. There's a corn shell, KSH. There's a ZSH, which I think it's pronounced Zish. Um, so all these various different uh, shells have their own shell scripting associated with them. And that's that's another reason. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay. Oh, back one. Oh, thank you. So on Windows, what we've got is kind of what we inherited from DOS, which is what they norm typically call the command shell, the CMD shell. Um, these files used to have a .bat extension, which is short for batch, as I was saying earlier, some kinds called batch scripts. Um, and sometimes they had a CMD extension, which was command. Around 2016 or so, a gentleman named Jeffrey Snover introduced PowerShell, uh, which is the second thing there, which was a huge step forward for shell scripting on Windows uh, because command shell is extremely primitive. Um, by writing some stuff in command shell, I understood why, um, if you've ever heard of uh, uh, Dykstra's famous paper about go to considered harmful, I started to understand why he thought it was harmful because you could only do things with go tos in the original bat files. There was no like there was no if and if that you in order to get past the end of the if statement you had to use a go to, and it's like oh I get what he's talking about. <laughs> PowerShell was much much closer to Bash, and uh, even an, an improvement on it. Uh, you, of course, you can always use Python and Ruby, and there's another one called TCLTK which. All three of those are really kind of cross-platform. TCLTK is not really as well known as Python and Ruby, but they're all scripting languages. And both the Mac OS X and Linux, there's Bash, which again, as I said, is the short for the born again shell. Um, 
Another thing that's present on Mac OS X and Linux, and I think this is present on pretty much every Unix operating system, Unix-based operating system, is what they call the shebang. Uh, the pound sign is the comment character in a shell script, usually. I, a matter of fact, I, I haven't run across a shell scripting language where it's not a comment character, and it's a comment character in Elixir, of course, too. When that comment character is followed by an exclamation point, like I showed at the bottom there, that's called shebang. That tells the uh, the Bash shell script interpreter or the shell script interpreter how to run the shell script. Because like I said, on Linux at least, and I, it may be true on Mac OS X as well, I think it is, you can use a different shell. And so it needs to know if you've got a shell script, hey, which shell should I be using to run this? Okay, you, now you can move ahead. Thank you. Okay, so why would we bother with shell scripts? Well, I have a couple of answers on that. Uh, automating stuff is a good thing. I, I don't have my copy of the Pragmatic Programmers handy, but I remember in there, uh, Mr. Hunt and Thomas saying something to the effect of automate everything you can. And my experience as a software developer, I agree with them. Automate everything you can because I might forget steps. I might forget to do things, but a computer won't. And if you can automate it, that's terrific. Um, there are times when you want to do things in multiple applications that kind of forces you to use shell scripts. Um, an example, let's say I want to grab a CSV file from a secure FTP site and then do some manipulation of the CSV in Excel and then show it to a user, uh, Excel, if you are on windows, um, you could probably hack together something to do FTP inside of Excel because Excel actually has this language built into it called visual basic for apps. But I think it'd be wiser to use an FTP app, you know, connect to the secured FTP, grab the file, and then you, you know, you pull it into Excel with, and do your macro stuff there, you know, right tool for the job. Um, there's also the thing of don't repeat yourself. If you have a set of steps that you do all the time, like, hey, I'm going to take, uh, matter of fact, one of the examples I'm going to show you a little later on is something I wrote because every day I would take and update my development branch from the master branch to make sure I wasn't too far out of sync with it. That was as I, my, I, I, every day I would say, okay, type git, you know, pull master, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of, this is dumb. Why, why am I doing this? I'm a developer. I automate things. Um, so I wrote a shell script with Elixir, which I'll show you in a little while to basically do exactly that pull the master branch and then whatever branch I was sitting on, it would take and merge it in or actually rebase it. And it saved me a ton of time. And again, because it's automated, I don't forget steps either. And finally, um, there's a property, which in shell scripts is kind of, is kind of a good thing really of no user interface. You don't have, if your shell script, um, like, oh, I don't know, is grabbing a file. You you don't really want, if you want to run this at like midnight, because that's when you're the least traffic on your on your network and that's the best way to update things, then you don't want to use your interface. You don't want to have to, somebody have to sit there and say, okay, at midnight, I got to grab this thing and put this thing in and all that. You don't want to have to do that. This is a shell script is great for this kind of thing. A matter of fact, I would say, that basically, if you um, if you have something you want to automate, a shell script is the way to go. Now, with Elixir, you have the option of like using like um, you know like um, something akin to a cron job, you know. But for most cases, probably easier to write the shell script and then hand it off to a cron job and have the cron job run it. So, okay. Uh, next script, please. Uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. So why not write shell scripts? For, for one, there's the issue of performance. Um, because, as I said, it's not truly compiled down to binary. It'll never perform as well. And I would say, for those of us who are doing Elixir, I, I don't really care. <laughs> performance is not why I picked Elixir. I picked Elixir because it made it possible for me to do multiple threads of execution safely. Um there's also the issue of security. Uh, 
because you're talking about default behaviors, right? You know, it's hard to it's hard to uh, secure anything really. If I needed to, well, with Elixir, there are ways I could actually use a secret and get in that way, like or go, go out to some vault and get the secret information and get it that way. But in general, shell scripts that isn't that isn't really an option. And finally, if you're talking about shell scripts like in the native scripting language, not like in Elixir or Python or Ruby or something like this, there's a lot of features that just aren't there or they're very hard to do. Um, I remember one time I had to write a shell script and I had to check if it was Monday. And I forget what the context was. It was something like, you you, you know, you wanted to set something for the week or something like this. And as easy as that would be to do an Elixir, just check what is the current day. Is it Monday? You know, return me a true, otherwise return me a false. In scripting languages like Bash, like Zish, stuff like this, it can be really, really difficult because there's not designed for it. And so that's a reason where you would want to maybe either build a true executable or build build an application and some, you know, like Python or Ruby or something like that, or just not have a shell script. Next slide, please. Okay. So finally we get to the meat of the meat of the talk or the the heart of the talk. <clears throat> How do you run an Elixir shell script? Now. You can run it with just Elixir, not Elixir C. Elixir C is the compiler. Elixir C will take whatever uh, script name.exs or script name.ex and turn it into a beam file. Uh, literally a file with a .beam extension. Um, so you can do it. You can do Elixir with the script name, and you can also, and this is uh, specific to uh, Linux. In Mac OS X, you can also put the shebang at the end there, slash usser bin env elixir. That tells it, I want to run this on elixir. And then you can do dot slash, mean current directory, script name.exs. In Linux and Unix, you have to tell it if you're running an app, uh, a script in your current directory. It doesn't automatically look in the current directory. That's it's something to do with security, but I can't remember what the explanation was. Windows does automatically look in the current directory. Linux and Mac OS X do not. So you have to tell it specifically. I want you to run this script in this current directory. Okay. Um, it seems someone has their hand up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's John. Um, the reason you can't run something in the current directory is you could uh, put something in because of the way the GPath thing works, you can put something in a directory that's the same name as a system command, and that's what would get run, unless you specifically set, tell it exactly where to find the, the executable. So you can have a security hole that you could put um, something something that did something bad in there, and people would think they were running cat or, or uh, more, and instead they were running something that's going to delete all their files. Oh. Thank you. I, I appreciate remember, that. I remember when that was that change was made. Yeah, I I knew it was something along those lines, and thank you for refreshing my memory. Yeah, I I knew it was something along the lines of some kind of security problem that they were trying to avoid. Um, and I, and you know, it, it, it's just it, there's and this is an editorial comment. I I apologize in advance, but there is a difference in the way that things are done on Unix and Linux and Mac even versus Windows. Windows always seemed to have this idea of one person on one machine and you didn't have to worry about anybody else. Whereas Unix and Mac OS X to an extent, they always had the idea of multiple people using the machine. And so they always had it set up in different ways to take care of security and stuff like that. By the way, before I forget, if you do the script name.exs with the shebang at the top, you do have to do a chmod plus X on the script name.exs because otherwise it will not run. Uh, that's another thing of of uh, Linux, which actually is a good thing. And before we leave this slide, the difference between .ex and .exs, they both compile, they both create a beam file. The difference is a .exs, when it's done with the beam file, it discards it. Whereas a .ex, 
it says keep this beam file. And so if you know you got a shell script that you're probably going to run the same thing over and over again, and you're not going to change it much, you're fine to name it .ex. It'll run just fine with Elixir script name .ex uh, or dot slash script name .ex. It'll run just fine. It what'll happen is it'll just leave a beam file there for you. But if you you know if it sees a beam file, it's not even gonna bother recompile things. It'll just run it. So like I say it's just it just the notion of a uh, script is usually that you want to be able to change it and rerun it and change it and rerun it, and so that's why they usually give it an EXS. Okay. Now, next slide, please. Um, there's another hand up. Do you want to take the question? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Hey, it's uh, Tommy. I was curious because I've been writing uh, actually a bunch of uh, .exs files, but okay. they were ran through Mix. Does the shebang work with Mix as well? Because that's actually really cool if I could just do dot .slash with my, like, because uh, it's got, like, um... dependencies at the top. That's a good question. I'm not, you know what? <laughs> you asked me a very good question. I don't know for sure. Um, nice. I know, I'll show you we'll, uh, oh, when uh, Michael gets to it, we'll, we'll look at this REPL and you can see exactly how that shebang thing works. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. Thanks. I thank you for no pointing worries. that out. I, now I need to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, if you can open that URL for me. Yeah, there you go. Okay, okay. good. Yeah, let's do this. Okay, so to start with is sudo. Sudo, okay. the bottom one. Okay. Can, so can this is a little it? shell script, and you'll notice it looks a heck of a lot like your plain old Elixir stuff, right? This is a little shell script that all it is for, for, and I would use this from other things, to test the current user, or I could pass in a username, uh, is a member of the sudo group. Are they able to pseudo things, right? So, um, and I, you know, as with any Elixir stuff, I document it with a module doc at the top. Um, and you'll note that comment there on the dot, it, it is pseudo dot EXS about requiring chmod plus X to run it from the script. Okay. And you, you can see on line one up there, that's that shebang I'm talking about. User bin and Elixir. Yeah. Um, so other than that, it's, as you can see, it's just plain old Elixir code. Uh, I can use specs on it, just like I can use on regular Elixir code. I could write unit test against it if I wanted to. I just don't bother because most of the time, like I say, when I'm doing a shell script. It's like, I'm just, I'm just doing it for myself. So I, you know, if, if it runs into something where it's like, oh, I didn't think about doing that. It's like, it's not in production. I'm not worried about it. Uh, if you scroll down a bit. See, I even had to figure out how to get the current username. And that system command is basically going to be your friend if you're doing shell scripts. Anything you have to do in terms of like the shell, you uh, are going to pass it the name of the uh, executable that you want to run. And you pass a second argument of parameters to that executable. In this case, I had to use a special value standard error I'm sorry, special atom, standard error, standard out, because the groups command would put out stuff. Um, for some reason, it put out stuff to the standard error instead of the normal standard out. Um, so I had to tell it, hey, redirect that to standard out so I could grab it. What will ha happen is when you run that command, it will return. If you were to look at like 34 of their groups list is, is literally a list of all the groups of strings. And then all I have to do, and that's the groups associated with the current user. All I have to do is take and search that list. Does that list contain uh, admin, if I'm on Apple, or sudo, if I'm on Linux? And that tells me if it's a sudo or, or not. Um, the system command on line 46 is basically, I have no parameters to that command. I just do who am I and no parameters to it. And uh, it comes back with the username as the first part of the tuple. And the second part of the tuple, which I did not specify, is actually the error level it's setting. Zero meets success. And that's pretty universal. Pretty much everywhere. If you see a zero as the error level, it means things succeeded. If you see anything else, then you, you got to figure out what is 
what's coming back because on an executable executable basis. The zero is pretty standard, but anything else is not. The username will come back with a, a trailing new line on it. So I trim it up before I hand it back. And so, um, gosh, I wish we could. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I really wish my screen were sharing like it normally would. <laughs> oh, is... oh, please load. Does it? Okay. Uh, something, something happened. Um, where did, where did, am I? Yeah, it's it it'll yeah, because it's gonna run the it's okay. gonna run the uh thing, but it needs to run it in a shell. Oh, uh, oh that's funny. <laughs> yeah, running it inside of the um darn it. Ah, oh, this is really annoying to me. Okay, I'm sorry. Um you'll just have to take my word for it that when you run it in the shell, what you would get because I, I checked it and made sure I I this works right, of course. <laughs> is you'll get, it'll say current user is runner, which apparently is what it has on there. And user runner is not a member of the sudoers group. So it, that's like say, and normally I wouldn't even bother to do this, but this is just to kind of demonstrate, you know, how this, how this stuff works. Um, so um, I would normally, if I, if I had this kind of thing in, in actual work that I was doing, then I would probably make this a dot EX like I did with, uh, the get utility at the top there, and then call it from other scripts. Okay. So get utility, you can see again, basically your, your standard Elixir module with all the, the standard accoutrements of a module. I even have like my, uh, my specs in there, my uh, dialyzer specs. Um, the thing about module registry attribute, if you're interested in that, I can tell you about it, but it's not important to this conversation. Um, and I, I put in like a, a basic git command because I wanted to, you know, I want I don't want to have to say every time system command git when I'm doing that over and over again. Um, and then I also put an indicate failure down there in line 23, which basically says um, just if I get anything, if I get an error, just toss back the error. Or if the error level is anything other than success, which is zero then throw back the error for me. Otherwise, throw back the okay. Um, so these are just various ut utility routines I've done to, to do things with Git, and they're all from the command line. Um, this is one of the things you might think to yourself, okay, Anora, you could do that from the command line, but why not, you know, why not import the API and all that? And yeah, you could. I just, I was just trying to do quick and dirty, uh, just stuff that I needed with Git. Um, Figuring out how to do the foreign function interface to put this into the uh, like Git and Rust or Rustler or something like that. Yeah, I could do that and it, it would be a lot faster and probably a lot cleaner, but I just didn't bother. Um, okay, so if you look at gut.exs, so there's a couple things in here I wanted to point out to you. Um, I'll go down a little further. Okay, line 40 there, def parse command line. There's a pot, you can use uh, this option parser, uh, line 43 there. You can use option parser to take uh, command line parameters on your shell script. Um, personally, I, I would say if you're using maybe more than one or two command line parameters, then probably you shouldn't be doing a shell script anyway, because, uh, because if, you know, if you have to tinker with that many settings, chances are it's not really your best candidate for a shell script. Shell script should, should be pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to discuss a lot about how you do parse. Uh, that's all well documented, and I, I don't see any point in spending time to go over it. Um, so uh, what that will do, and in this case, there's two different, different parameters I had got. What this is doing is I specified because you have old Git repositories have master as the main branch and newer ones use main. Uh, I wanted to allow for the possibility of being able to say, okay, uh, yeah, I know it's normally master or main, but this time use so-and-so instead as the main branch or uh, the trunk branch. So that's what that's about. And that's why that parameter is there. Uh, I also sometimes wanted to be able to see what would happen 
if I if I did the merge without actually merging. And so I passed it a, a dry run parameter, which is a Boolean. So I'd either say, okay, dry run is true or dry run is false. And that would allow me to, well, I wouldn't bother to dry run false because that's just running it. But if I did dry run true, it would it would show me what would happen if it did the merge, um, which honestly, that didn't quite get to where I wanted it to get to. <laughs> it's it's the idea is there, but I haven't quite got it yet. <laughs> I think it's like a, a minus n or something I'd get to tell to tell to uh, show you what it would do if it, it before without actually running it. I haven't got around to it yet though. Okay, so if you scroll down a bit, Michael, uh, here, line sixty five. Remember I was saying about how you could pull in other files, other other code into this? This is how you do it. You use system get env to get the, well, in my case, I have to find, figure out where the directory is, where the file I'm looking for is. So in my case, I put it in home, and then under that, the shell scripting with Elixir directory. And then I do a code require file, and I have to pass it the name of the file, which in this case is get utility.ex, that top one, and then the directory, in this case, the base util directory. And when I do that, then I run the, the git update trunk.fetch dependencies. And you notice this is outside of the, the module now. The module's been defined, and now I'm running these things outside of the module. And that's that's another thing about the shell scripting. You define the module or whatever it is, and then at the end of the module, that's now that's now available to you, and you can run whatever you want from the module. So you'll notice, like on line seventy-eight, there, I use git utility at the current branch name, and then I say, okay, I want to get the trunk branch from the command line. Well, you know, so if it's default to, in this case, it's default to main. If I wanted to pass a minus minus trunk. Uh, to say use master instead, then the get trunk branch command line would handle that. Okay, and then finally, if if the trunk branch is not the branch I'm currently sitting on, then I switch to the trunk branch because when I when you do a, a get rebase, I think I do a get rebase here. Uh, when you do a get rebase, it you can't do it onto the you know like I can't say get rebase onto this other branch. You got to rebase onto the current branch. So you have to switch to that trunk branch, whatever it is. Um, and again, you guys can see that what I've done here is I've taken advantage of the with construct to like, if one step fails, then the whole thing stops and it's, nothing happens. So again, using Elixir to be more intelligent about how I do things with a shell script. And oh gosh, I wish I could show you guys this. <laughs> I wish, oh man, I'm so annoyed. Um, I could I could try the fork. Somebody suggested that. Yeah, try that. But if you don't have a <laughs> Repolit ID, yeah, 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 used to be able. Although to... any of you, I when we're done, I'll send you the slide deck. You can fork it yourselves, um, uh, and you know, and use this as as reference if you want to do more shell scripts. You can use this as a starting point for sure. Uh, I'd be happy to, you know, I'd be happy to hear. Somebody uh, took this work I this you know this little bit of work I did and came up with something brilliant. That would be wonderful. I'd love it. Uh, the file about main.exs, I believe there's like a third thing that you can do in terms of running something, but it's not a shell script. It's actually like building an executable from Elixir source, and that's eScript. And I think the main.exs, my memory serves, and it's been a while because I haven't had need, needed it for, for recently. The main.exs is what the eScript looks for to start the application running. It's not a true binary in the sense of like I've got, um, like on, um, on Windows, I'd have .exe. It's not that kind of binary. It's still, you still got a beam file. It's just the eScript is like basically a stripped down Erlang runtime. And basically, that's all it is. And it will allow you to run those scripts. So, okay. Okay, so uh, do it, are there any questions about what we did here in terms of the shell scripting? Just basically remember, you define your module, and then at the end of your module, what you do is you call your routines within your module, 
And, you know, like if, if you had IO puts inside of like fetch dependencies there, until you call fetch dependencies, you're not going to see anything. That was one of the things that tripped me up when I first started was like, I'd put IO puts and things. It's like, it's not doing anything. Why is it not putting out anything to the console? And that was because I had to actually call the routine outside of the module and then it executed it and then it showed me stuff. So just, um, just, you know, for reference. Okay. Um, any hands up? No, I, okay. I don't see any. Okay. So we can go back to the slide deck. Next slide. So, okay. So what are the benefits of Elixir shell scripting? Well, Elixir and Erlang, uh, really anything that's an Elixir or Erlang, you can get from a shell script. If I needed to, for whatever reason, I need to go to a REST API, pull back a JSON file, parse it, I could do that from within a shell script. I I can't think of a reason I would do it that way as opposed to another way, except maybe testing. Like I wanted to pull back something from a REST API and test and make sure I'm getting back a certain thing. And so I just write a quick little shell script to do it. But basically anything you can do in Elixir, you can do here. Think about like if, if you need to do a, a, a nightly process and you wanted to make sure the result of that got stashed off into a database. Well, you've got Ecto available to you. You could do, you know, use a little SQLite database and use Ecto to go against it and just put the result in that SQLite database. It's there. It works. And of course, the other benefit is you've got the bean. You've got that, you know, that wonderful scalability. You've got that wonderful ability to run things in parallel. That's all there. That's all there with shell scripting. Uh, again, honestly, I haven't ever seen a case where with a shell script, I need to run like multiple things at the same time, but I could if I needed to. And I think a lot of us as developers, uh, we don't think enough about how we can parallelize things, how we can make, you know, like if I'm calculating, if for some reason I had to pull multiple files from different sources in a shell script, there's nothing stopping me from pulling them. Usually there's nothing stopping me from pulling them, you know, simultaneously. As long as I wait until they're all pulled, I'm in good shape. You can do that with a shell script from Elixir if you want to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so again, a couple <laughs> of drawbacks. The limited UI is actually a drawback too, because if you need to, like say, if you need to specify, you know, and this I'm talking specifically about Elixir, not shell scripts in general. Shell scripts in general, you can usually share pretty easily with other people. You just hand them the shell script and say, here, run it on your machine. Make sure you put chmod plus X, but it'll run on anybody's machine. But when you do it with Elixir and Erlang, it becomes a little trickier because they've got to have Elixir, at least the runtime installed in their machine. Um, so that's like I say, it's a little trickier. But for me, what I do usually is I just use shell script for myself. I don't care. I, you know, if somebody else can't run it, I don't care. Not my problem. <laughs> Here's the script. Figure out how to run it on your machine. <laughs> I Back in the day, uh, earlier before I think everyone was on the call, we were talking about I used to do F Sharp. And I hacked together an F Sharp script because what happened at my at the place I was working at the time is they had like this shared resource and they had a website up, an internal website that would tell you if someone was using it. But they set it up such that if someone was using it, the next person to come in would just knock them off. There was no like, oh, well, hell, oh, hold on, so-and-so is using it. No, it would just get knocked off. So I wrote a little F-sharp shell script to check the website, scrape it. You know, is somebody using it? If they are, then just put a message up. So-and-so is using this. Or if they're not, then, you know, then go ahead and grab it. And I had a few people ask me about that. It's like, hey, can you give me that script? It's like, sure. You got F-sharp handy? <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um I see, minor drawback, minor drawback. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So in, in conclusion, uh, a couple things I just want to emphasize. Uh, and hopefully, you know, if you take nothing else away from this talk, hopefully you'll, you'll remember these things. Um, it's great for keeping your Elixir in practice. I, I, I heard a lot of people say, hey, yeah, I did Elixir for a long time and I just recently got to where I can do it for my day job. If you can't do it for your day job, this is a terrific way to keep your Elixir in practice. Because, you know, again, if you're writing shell scripts, even at your day job, 
chances are no one's going to care about what it does other than you. So if you do it in Elixir, it's your day job. And, and somebody says, well, why would you write that in Elixir? It's like, hey, it's for me. I don't care. You know, um, as long as you're not sharing with anybody, it's fine. And of course, with Elixir, and you and you can say the same thing about Python, Ruby, and TCL, TK, and all that stuff. You got better scripting. But why would I bother with, you know, R Python and Ruby and stuff like that when I've got Elixir to do this? And I, I like Elixir, and I want to keep my Elixir in practice, so I so I use it for that. Um, last slide, please. So, wow, that really doesn't show up, does it? <laughs> I thought I put that in blue. <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, this is my uh, Anorio Cananachi, my email address there, and like I said, I'll share the slide deck, so hopefully you guys will be able to, uh, I'll share it with Michael, and Michael can share it out to everybody else. Um, on Twitter is old Dutch cap and I'm Mastodon at Honorio at Mastodon ACM.org. Um, if you guys, I know sometimes people think of questions after a talk is done, like 10 minutes after, Oh shoot, I should have asked my so-and-so feel free to contact me. I'm happy to tell, I'm happy to talk about anything that question. I don't, who asked about mix? Somebody asked about mix and that's a great question. I'll have to research that and see what I can get back on you. Um, but that's how you get a hold of me if you need to get a hold of me. And um, I, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to do what I can to uh, answer them. Nice. Thank you so much. That was really like informative about the environment and everything. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'll, stop sh I'll stop sharing now. And yeah, does anyone have questions? Eric. Christensen. Oh, nice. Oh, is that clapping or a question? <laughs> Just clapping. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very kind. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, when Michael said to me, you know, asked me to do this, I I run a, a meetup here in Detroit, and so I know how it is about finding speakers, and I'm happy to do this. Because, um, I, uh, yeah, I may I may hit him up to talk at our, our meetup. <laughs> but, <laughs> For sure. <laughs> But it's it's really it's really pretty flattering if somebody thinks you you have enough something interesting to say to share with people. That's pretty flattering too. So, um, but uh, like I say, that REPL it should be available to everybody. And like I say, when I get a chance, I'll send a slide deck along. And um, yeah, I thought about putting that code on GitHub, and I may still. But I thought you know with the REPL, if you've got the, if you've got a signature, you know, an ID in there, you can run it yourself and see what it does and then just mess around with it and say, oh, what happens if I do so-and-so instead? So I thought that would be kind of a, uh, maybe a handier way for people to play with it if they cared to. Um, I believe someone suggested live books too in the chat. Do you think it would work in that format? It should, yeah. I actually, uh, here. I wish I could share my screen. I can show you something. Uh, on DevTO, I did uh, I did a post. Uh, you got you may, you may remember I said there was that thing about the module register attribute and all that, and I said I could explain it if anyone were interested. In it. My post on DevTO was about that because I'm one of those uh, developers that again I don't like to repeat myself. So if I want to share a value between modules, there's three ways to do it that I found. And that's on it's on DevTO. I'm sorry, I'm getting to the point. And I actually set up a live book to run the examples I had on DevTO. And then I also thought, well, I can do that and REPL it too. So if someone wants to mess with it, they can mess with it that way. So yeah. Uh I can post a link in the chat. I can do that. I didn't even think about that. Here's the link. Nice. Uh, IOANSI. That's a good suggestion, Thomas. Yeah, I um, I kind of got away from trying to do that because for the longest time I was working on Windows boxes and doing shell scripting on Windows boxes. And Windows does not... <laughs> support IOANSI right. It's like, it, and it's one of the things that just kind of, we never figured out what it was, how we could make it work. Uh, I still don't know if it does. And since they got Windows Substance for Linux now, no one bothers. So it's like, you know, 
But yeah, IO ANSI would be a good thought. Yeah, because that would be a great way to style things to make them like uh, stand out if you need to show something to a user. I didn't show you, but I actually with that, because my memory just isn't what it used to be, like that uh, GUT.EXS, I needed to remember how to put the, the command line parameters in. I always had a problem remembering two dashes, name, space, argument, right? So I made myself a little man page. And that's another thing I want to automate one of these days with a shell script, because there's a process for making a man page. Uh, you, you run like uh, postdoc or something like that. I forget what it is. And postdoc will let you put uh, like a markdown file there and then it'll translate it to something else and you run something else and you deploy it to a certain directory and then it's, it's available as a man page. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, but uh, I, I, might, I might just, you know, write that up at some point and share it with everybody if anyone wants to see it. So... I can't believe I was that clear that there are no questions. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> or if you if you if you're really shy, you can ask me afterwards if you want. Um, I don't know if there's a question as much as the the DBA team recommend at work recommended a way to copy stuff from one Postgres database to another, uh -huh. and they, they recommended using this uh, Python script they use. So it right. reads from reads the Postgres tables. And reads Postgres from one database and writes it to standard out. And then the very next thing, read from standard out and write to read from standard in and write to another um, table, which right. it never serializes into the language you're using. You don't, you're not using your own memory. It's just using the system. Um, but yeah, we ended up taking that idea and like, well, we're more fluent with Elixir, so let's do it with Elixir. And we were concerned, like, well, if we ask them for help, what are they going to say then? Uh, but in the end, they only cared about, you know, what are the SQL queries you're ending up with? And right. um, that, yeah, it worked great. Was that, is there, I thought there's like a PostgreSQL utility, like DB dump or something like that. You yeah. put it in a database and it would create all the SQL scripts for you to create statements and everything. I, I guess it would. We only wanted to copy certain things from certain tables to, you know, uh, I get you. database. I get you. But yeah, even using Elixir just to compose a bunch of ugly SQL, um, I felt like it made sense. Or get just getting a bunch of IDs and wanting to like take chunks of them and feed them into a, other bits of SQL you're going to create. Um, I felt like it was great for that. Like it, um, it, yeah, I, I don't think it would be the selling point for Elixir. Like it's the Elixir syntax is not that good. The people are going to drop what they're doing and pick it up, but, right. uh, but definitely, but I, I think it's great to, to just be like, this is the language I want to know most because it has the right. most utility for me. Let me just keep working in that and not spend a bunch of time, you know, on something else. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, I uh, like I said, I I don't believe there's anything I could do there. What I showed you guys with Elixir, that I could do all that stuff with Python or Ruby. I probably could do it with like some flavor of Basic if I really wanted to. <laughs> I don't feel like tormenting myself that way. But uh, but yeah, I I like Elixir, and I want to keep my Elixir practiced. You know, uh, I, I was working on. Uh, I made a modification to my .iexes so I could automatically connect to a uh, backend database and, you know, and get all the uh, aliases in there for the various schemas. And that way I could practice using Ecto to query the database as opposed to using like, um, like the REPL that came with Postgres. Uh, and that was really, that was really good that was really a nice way to do it because that you know okay now i have to compose the ecto statement and run it and everything and gives me practice to do that i haven't messed oh. with that is that something that you would do locally and then or it's it's committed to source control and then when you open it up in qa or in production you've got those same aliases available or is it kind of a local locally installed ruby iex settings thing like where, where does that take effect um, 
it's uh, basically you have a .iex.exs on your local machine and you start okay. IEX, it'll read it and use that. Okay. Uh, there's even a parameter. You can even pass a parameter on the IEX command line to tell it, hey, I don't want to use IEXEXS. I want to use this other one. Okay. Um, which is probably what I would do if I were like, okay. you know, if I were taking a chance of, of like checking into version control, I'd probably give it a different name just so no okay. one could accidentally run it. So um, then you'd have a different one for each repo and, you know, just use that yeah. specific one when you start it up. Yeah. Okay. Put that in exactly. the readme, how to start IEX. Okay. I haven't yeah. done that. If you want, so. I can, I can, um, I'll sh I can share a link. My IEX, I modified it a little more and there's an interesting technique and I don't know if, I, I think, I can't remember if I found this on the web and used it or if I had to kind of hack it together myself, but there's a technique to create a secondary connection to the database and this way I don't have to, and I make a read only connection so I can be sure that there's no way I can mess up anything on the database because all I'm doing is querying anyway. Um, so it, it, like I say, the main thing is I like to be able to practice my, you know, my ecto, you know, so I get a little stronger with it because honestly, it, it's one of the things I'm so used to using repls and stuff like that. And just, okay, I'll just grab this column and this column, this column. And it's like, no, I want to use ecto so I get better with it, you know, so. That's great. Nice. I'm going to stop the recording too.